Hi, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind. And today we are welcoming um, Judy Kramer, who is a someone who grew up and her parents grew up in Lahaina Maui, to get her reactions not only to the um, to the terrible uh, fires, um, et cetera, um, but also um, to, you know, in our uh, notion of our title, Journeys of the Mind, um, you know, we want to ask her all about her experiences in Lahaina, Ma Maui. So we'll have a collection of these memories, you know, after we do several of these interviews. But the most important interview is with Judy Kramer, who was uh, taught at Kamehameha for many years, started their service learning, coordinated service learning, and is now the educational director of Youth Service Hawaii, which is a nonprofit dedicated to service learning. I hope I got that all right, Judy. Did I get it all right? Yes, you did. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. Well, I'm going to start right away. So tell us about your growing up in Lahaina, Maui, and then eventually getting to uh, going to Lahaina Luna as a high school student. Oh, growing up in Lahaina because it was, you know, 68 years ago or so. Um, Lahaina at that time was a very sleepy town, uh, not very in fact, there wasn't uh, any tourists at that time in, uh, 68 years ago. I remember that um, the hotels at Ka'anapali were just being built. And there, it was just one of those things that was just starting uh, to uh, become a tourist place. So it was mainly a... A uh, plantation, sugarcane plantation town. Many or most of the people who uh, lived there worked in the plantation, uh, and we had. It was a very sl um, slow moving and very sleepy town. Everybody knew everybody. In fact, when I lived downtown, we lived in these um, plantation homes. Uh, downtown, uh, right be, right behind Front Street. And um, when I was uh, four years old, I would go every Sunday morning and I was given a quarter, 25 cents, and I would go to this bakery called Hapwo Bakery, and they made the best bread. So we would, I would go in my nightgown and I would walk down to this bakery by myself when I was four and I would buy a loaf of bread and um, bring it home, which is the reason why I think I just love the smell of baking bread because it, it conjures up all these wonderful memories of uh, Lahaina and, and the slow moving town that it was when I was growing up. Uh, went to Kamehameha Third School, which is right next to the banyan tree, um, played uh, Chase Master, which is tag, uh, on the banyan tree branches. We would run on the, we would, well, not run, we'd, we'd walk fast on the banyan tree branches and we would play tag on, on it. We would swing on the uh, hanging roots that came down from the branches of the banyan tree. We'd have lots and lots of fun. Uh, our May Day programs were held underneath the banyan tree. We had um, lots of good times. My brother learned how to swim in that, um, right outside that harbor um, in Lahaina. Uh, and many of us learned how to swim um, right in front of the, of the school, which, uh, which was right up against the, the beach in Lahaina. Uh, it was a great time and lots of good memories with lots of good friends and, um, you know, our slow moving, we could ride our bikes in town um, with not having any problems and didn't lock doors um, because we didn't need to. So that was a great thing. Then we moved up to Lahaina Luna Road um, we, our home was right on Lahaina Luna Road and, um, we, uh, I moved there when I was five and we have been there. We were there, um, until, um, August 8th when the fire took the, took the home. 
but that is where we grew up and many, many, many memories of uh, that in that home and lots of good times. Yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Judy, also, you were born in 1955. Yes. And so you were born actually in the territory of Hawaii before Hawaii became a state. Yes. Yes, so I did. That's, that's absolutely wonderful and not something that many of us can say, including myself. Um, not because I'm, I'm older than you are, but of course, I didn't move to Hawaii till later on in life. Um, but so you mentioned, you know, that you um, were able to walk, you know, as a four-year-old down and get the loaf of bread. So I have two questions. One is, you know, what do you think inspired the, the safe conditions for you to do that? And number two, I mean, everyone, you know, was like, you know, what Hillary Clinton said about a village and things like this. And the second question is, what type of people that meaning ethically, um, you know, uh, worked on the plantations and then made up the, the majority of people in Lahaina? Okay, so uh, what made um, it made me able to at four, when I was four, to walk without having any um, worries about anybody um, jumping me or, you know, stealing my quarter for the bread was that it was a town in which everybody looked after each other. Um, people knew when um, I would be going out and they would kind of keep track of me. Um, my brother, uh, who is six years older than I, he, he would, um, my, he has fond memories of when he was really young that uh, he would, um, my my mom would go to work at a uh, like a department. It was it was a department store, but not really a department store. It was more like a sundry and and a store that had all kinds of. It was like a plantation store that had all kinds of different things in it. And then my brother would go. My mom would go to work, and my brother, um, when he woke up, would just grab his um, pillow and his blanket, and he would just walk to my mom's. Um, store. So it was one of those things that everybody looked out for each other and you could wander around because people knew who you were and you know who people were. The people, um, and most of the people worked, as I said, in the plantation. And so many of the people were um, of Japanese, Filipino, um, Portuguese, some Chinese, some Hawaiian people um, of that ancestry. But um, yeah, people knew everyone, and we lived in a in a um, plantation camp. So again, in the plantation camp, because everybody worked on the plantation, um, they you know we knew each other, and everybody knew each each other. My dad worked in the uh, plantation office as sort of like an accountant bookkeeper. Um, my mom in the beginning worked, as I said, in uh, in that store. Uh, Lahaina store and um, later uh, worked for a dentist. So she, uh, everybody knew her and every, and she knew everybody. Um, it was very funny because people would come up to my mom because my mom was a dental assistant for uh, first a doc Dr. Uno and then later a Dr. Keho and people would come up to her and they would say, oh, this is Takatsuka. That's my maiden name. She would, they would say, this is Takatsuka. I have this thing in my tooth. And can you look at my tooth right here? And say, ah. You know, they would open up their mouths and they would, they would, they would, uh, when she was like shopping at the grocery store, they would do those kind of things, you know, and they would say, oh, and she would say, oh, just come to the, come, come to the dentist and we'll help you. So, um, yes. Yeah, so she, I, I know that because I would be standing there waiting waiting for her like this, you know, and people would come up to her and talk to her about their dental problems. So it was one of those things and people knew, you know, everyone knew everyone. So that, that was, that was what made it a safe place and a safe town to live in. Um, and then when the, uh, hotels started to open up, people would, would then work in hotels. Uh, but the most, the majority of the people still worked in, um, in the plantation. And then there were uh, immigrants who came later on and they started working in the hotels. Uh, my dad worked um, part-time. He worked full-time at the plantation and then a few few hours a night 
in the hotels um, as my brother got closer to going to college and they needed more monies for that, save monies for that. So, yeah, so that's how things were in those days and very safe and uh, very wonderful place to be, to be living. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more, Judy, about the plantations, because, you know, that is often referenced by people and politicians in Hawaii, but we rarely get a sense of what it was like living on a plantation and, and you know, what you were growing and things like that. Um, not everyone uh, knows uh, about, um, you know, our major industry um, before tourism. So, um, yeah, people lived in the plant. So, um, everybody worked, not everybody, but many, many, many people worked in plantation. My grandfather came over from Hiroshima and he worked and came up specifically to work in the plantation with thoughts of moving his family back to Japan. but. Once his family got settled here, nobody wanted to move back to Japan. So he ended up staying here. My, um, so he and my grandmother both um, worked in the plantation. My dad worked in the plantation. Um, and my brother worked in the plantation. My, my grand mom, grandmother and grandfather lived in a plantation camp called Pump Camp. And it was called that because um, there were, there was a, there was like a, a reservoir above the plant above the camp, and that would pump water down into the camp. Um, my uh, in the camp there was there were all different um, sections in which people lived. So there was a section that had mostly Japanese, and there was a section that had mostly Filipinos, and um, mostly Japanese and Filipinos in those at that time. Um, and they, um, and that was part of pump camp. Um, it was a way, Waini village, they called it. And, uh, it was right in the middle of the cane fields. So, um, people, we lived, they lived there. We lived downtown. We lived in the town. Um, and, but that still was a camp. Uh, and most of the people who lived there, I guess, were like office workers. Um, but my brother at, and most of the people who, boys especially, when they got to be high school age and then um, got, then went all the way to college during the summer, they would come back and they would work at the plantation. They would cut um, sugar cane. They would help harvest the sugar cane and stuff like that. Um, that was one of the things that happened. We had, um, you know, we knew that... Um, there was going to be harvesting of sugarcane because they would, you know, actually burn. They would it, would, it would be a controlled burn of sugarcane, um, the leaves off so that, um, it would be easier to harvest the, um, the sugarcane stalks. And we would, when we were little, it was so much fun to catch, um, the sugarcane ash that, um, you know, that would float down into your yard and we would try to catch it without um, it, the sugar cane, the ash uh, disintegrating, disintegrated. And um, we had so much fun uh, doing those kinds of things. Um, yeah, it was, it was lots of, and lots and lots of fun. We had, we did have um, a time in which every so often, because to keep the mosquitoes down, they would have these fogging it, nowadays, that would be awful. People would not be able to do any of that. But there was this, I don't know what it was, insecticide or something that would just, with a truck, would just fog up our, our, um, our roads, come down the roads and just fog up the, the um, camps and stuff. And, and we just like, oh, you know, it was, it was bad smelling, but it didn't last very long. So we just kind of let it go and just kind of breathe it in, but we're okay. People live, you know, our uh, people from plantations. My mom lives to be 95. My dad lived to be 90. And so, you know, it seems like it didn't bother us, I guess. I don't know, but that's what keep, kept the, um, the mosquitoes down, I guess. Yeah. Fogging these foggers, they were called. I said, you know, I know, I know the chemicals that were involved with that. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, day, you know, we in Hawaii, as you well know, tent our houses by putting in poison in our houses and gassing in our houses 
and then coming back because we have so many bloody insects, including cockroaches that fly. Yeah, so that's just great. Um, Judy, tell me about your experiences at Lahaina Luna um, High School because that's such an unusual school. And I remember distinctly about tw 20 years ago or so, we were in this big conference and the president of Punahou School on Oahu stood up and said, you know, I'm, we were the oldest school west of the Mississippi. And you said, uh, I'm afraid not. Um, you know. So tell us about, like, of course, because that is Lahaina Luna, not Punahou School. So uh, tell us about your experience at Lahaina Luna because it's such a wonderful, wonderful school. Yes, Lahaina Luna is, um, it is the oldest school west of the Rockies. It was established in 1831. Um, uh, by missionaries, they wanted to have, um, people become, uh, educated so that they could actually, in the beginning, wanted to spread the gospel, but, um, then it became one of those things that Kamehameha III, uh, uh, said that he wanted to have his people be educated. So, you know, people like, um, Samuel Kamakao and David Malo, who are very well noted, um, historians of um, the Hawaiian history uh, went to, they were the in the first graduating class at Lahaina Luna. And um, going there, uh, so that was the first graduating class. And then later on, Lahaina Luna became like a um, industrial school in that we had a farm, we had a dairy, um, and there were boarders who came, who lived on campus, and there were 144, 122 boarders that lived on campus. And uh, there were two dormitories, and they, um, and they worked on the farm, and uh, they did various um, chores. I just was at a reunion uh, with um, some of the boarders. And we were talking about um, their memories as as boarders at Lahaina Luna, and so um, the because the school was had was a farm, the boarders would um, wake up early in the morning before six o'clock, and they would um, they would make their beds and fold their clothes, and they were it was very regimented, and they uh, went down to um, to punch their number in this huge it looked like a clock with many numbers around it and it was like a punch clock and they would come they would punch their number in and then they would go working uh my last year as a, a freshman in 1969 i think it was um was the year that um it was the last year for um for the dairy uh, the boarders would milk the cows and they would pasteurize the milk and we would be able to drink the milk that um, the boarders um, got from milking those cows. Uh, and um, there was a piggery, there were chickens, there was a farm that grew all kinds of different vegetables. They It was pretty self-sustaining uh, for the boarders there. And, um, and uh, we you know, benefited at, even in our uh, cafeteria, the kinds of foods that um, that was being produced by our, uh, the farm that was right there. The, the boarders also got to learn uh, a skill, different skills. Um, and I remember one time where um, on the intercom, we were in school and on the intercom, the, uh, I guess it was the principal said, well, all boarders, uh, report down to the punch clock because we're going to need to round up some cows because they had gotten out of, round up some cows. So apparently these cows had gotten out of their, out of their pasture and they were roaming around somewhere. And so these boarders had to go and round up these cows um, right during school time because they, they needed them done right away. So my friend who uh, I was talking with them just recently at my reunion and they said that um, they went to, uh, to the military right after, um, right after high school. And many of them said military was a breeze for them compared to how regimented their, um, school was like in, um, uh, their regimented, their life was like 
at uh, as a boarder in school. So they really um, had lots of uh, good skills that they learned. In fact, one of the boarders who became a principal or vice principal of a school in San Jose, California, uh, said that he still folds his clothes the way he was taught when he went to Lahaina Luna. So it, those kinds of skills are still there for him, in him uh, as as he continued to grow older. Yeah. So it was it was a great school. Lahaina Luna is still continuing to be a great school. Um, and um, yeah, we hope that you know as as the town continues to rebuild that you know the kids at Lahaina Luna will continue to. Uh, carry on the legacy that, that is so important for the High Luna High School. Well, Judy, that notion of getting an announcement at any school, asking people to go out and herd cattle, and in this case, dairy cows, yeah. uh, you know, that's just a crack up. I mean, it's just, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, may happen in the, in the Midwest, you know, but, but having met a lot of the um, university students in Iowa and Nebraska, when I've gone back for AP readings of, of history, as I'm a historian, as you know, um, you know, it's just the salt of the earth. And I think that many of the things do you, let, let me go back to you. So, you know, as part of your uh, work now, um, you, um, are, uh, an, uh, you know, the ED of, a of an organization that is, you know, devoted to, um, service learning. And it seems to me that you, when you talk about this, you grew up with service learning and, you know, it was learning to produce the food on the tables. And so that's rem quite remarkable. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I think it's part of who I am as, um, in terms of a servant, service learning and servant leader. So, um, yes, um, part of Youth Service Hawaii, which is what I'm is a, executive director of and you are treasurer of, we, um, we honor so much and we think that that's the best way for people to learn because, as I said, that person still to this day, um, still incorporate some of the things they learned in high school in terms of um, the service that they did and, and the kinds of skills they learned um, being of service to the school. And so um, service learning is such a wonderful way to, to learn and to, um, to have civic engagement and to, and to actually um, use whatever uh, things you learn in school in a very uh, meaningful way because uh, you're being of service to people or the to the environment. So service learning is certainly, I'm very, um, I'm very, uh, I don't what the word is, but um, i very sold on the idea that that is the way to go in terms of having kids, um, having the impact of education on kids is through service, using their knowledge that they learn in a meaning in a meaningful way uh, doing being of service to uh, their community. And Judy, before I start to um, ask you about uh, the fire because you were in it and I know about your house, I just wanted to let our audience know that you you after Lahaina Luna, you went to the University of Arizona in Tucson. you came back to Hawaii and served as a teacher for many for four decades, if I'm not mistaken yes. at um, Kamehameha schools, which if for people, on the continent, uh, we must realize that you have to be a part Hawaiian ancestry to go to those schools. And you served once again. And, um, you know, when I was talking to you one day, I remember years ago, you were mentioning that, you know, a certain like a quarter of your class, uh, you know, came from really um, very poor, um, poor in terms of economics, not necessarily poor in terms of, of culture or in wealth of, of family love. Um, that always has to be a distinguished quality. But now let's return um, to recent events in Lahaina. And I'm just going to let you describe what happened um, in your own words. And um, we at Think Tech Hawaii um, really like to develop ideas deeply, meaning we want to hear the full story. We don't want just a sound clip. And that's the, you know, that's the legacy of the mensch Jay Fidel. But I I'm going to stop talking about Jay and talk about you. So uh, let us know what happened, uh, Judy, because you were there that day and you were in there. Yes. So that morning, um, there were actually two fires. I don't know if people know that. There were two fires. The first fire was of early in the morning. Uh, there was some electricity that went out, and it was about 8 o'clock when we, I think, lost electricity. 
we my nephew and his family, so that means my nephew, his wife, and his two children, ages seven and three, uh, were leaving to go back to Iowa. They were staying with us in my f uh, family home and on Lahainun Road, and they were leaving to go back to Iowa. They were leaving um, Maui at 12 o'clock noon, um, but we wanted to make sure that they wanted to make sure that they were, that there were no glitches. So we left about eight o'clock in the morning. And even then the wind was very strong and there were some down poles. We had to do some detours actually to get out of Lahaina because of the down poles that were already um, across. Well, it wasn't the poles, but it was the wires that were across the roads. Um, I'm not sure if the wires were alive or not, um, but I'm sure that um, that pe the police officers were, were uh, directing us. And so <clears throat> we got out of Lahaina. There wasn't a problem getting out of Lahaina then. And uh, we dropped them off, uh, had breakfast, came back around 12, 1 o'clock, came back to, um, and that by, at that time, the bypass was still open, um, came back. No, I'm sorry. The bypass, we had to detour a little bit. And so the bypass, excuse me, at, when we got home, there was, because of the wind, there were downed, uh, there were shingles that were flying around that were blown off people's um, roofs. There was, um, when we got back to my family home, there was broken lumeria tree branches, uh, leaves that were all gone uh, off the branches. The um, the netting that was on top of the uh, greenhouse uh, that was part of um, attached to our patio had blown off. So it was a fairly um, substantial wind. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, we're going to have to clean this mess up. We're going to have to wait for the... Um, for the wind to die down so that, uh, because no sense we clean it up then. Then at about two o'clock, no, excuse me, 2.30, we saw, uh, we heard um, fire engines racing up Lahainlina Road, which is where we live on, on Lahainlina Road. And um, then we saw some smoke coming down, but I thought, oh, good, the, that's okay because the, you know, the, um, the, fire engines were up there and they were going to take care of this fire. And it was a brush fire. We've had, Lion and I has had brush fires before. So it was a brush fire. They're going to take care of it. Fine. When we, um, but then the smoke got to be really, really thick and it started to race down uh, Lailun Road because of the winds that was blowing. And then it became a little bit hard to breathe because of all the smoke that was coming down. I didn't see any flames. It was mostly smoke. And um, when we got, when I got into our patio, the smoke was so hot that we decided, okay, it's time for us to evacuate. We did not have, there was, it was our decision. There was no, um, there was nobody was that come, was coming to say, evacuate your home, nobody. There were people that was coming down La High Luna Road that was already evacuating. So, um, we got into that line coming down Lahaina Road to evacuate. Got to the main intersection of Lahaina Road and um, Honoa Pilani Highway. The police officers and there were the those were the first police officers that, that we saw. There were two of them. They um because there were down poles on either side of the highway, um, and that's the reason why a lot of people got caught in that traffic and with all that lines of cars that you always see that were burnt because of the down poles that were all over the place. So um, we had to dodge, uh, we had to go down Front Street dodging um, poles and we had to actually, when we got to um, Front Street, we were stuck because people who were turning towards, who were turning north to go to the evacuation center, which was the civic center, um, that line of cars was not moving at all. And that was, I, I suspect that was a line of cars that were burnt that you see in, in um, many of the pictures. Um, so we waited for about 10 minutes and we just didn't move. We couldn't even get into the line. 
we were um, trying to get into the line, but we couldn't. So um, my brother said, I'm going to turn around. And he said, and we looked on the towards Wailuku, um, and we saw that there was a little bit of movement of cars as well as um, blue sky way down, far down um, towards uh, Wailuku. So we decided to turn around. And even then, as we went around, there were many, many, many down poles. We'd go down, a, we'd um, head down a street and we saw down poles. So we had to turn around, we had to go down another street to find an, another street that wouldn't have down poles. One of the streets, Luokini Street, was um, a one-way street, but we went the opposite way because that was the only way to get out. And um, there were people, thank goodness for these people because these were people Lahaina Town was not taken yet, so um, this was about three thirty, four o'clock. Lahaina Town was not taken yet, and so there were people who were actually cleaning the roads to let us through. I hope to God that they got out because they were helping us get through. Didn't seem like they were getting into their cars to to evacuate, and that was because the the fire had not come down yet. So we finally got out to um, the highway. And there were Hiko people, and these people were also helping us, you know. Um, there were at least eight down poles down on the highway. And so we were trying to get out, and the Hiko people, I, if they were helping or moving the poles and moving the lines, there were li down lines all over the place, down cable lines all over the roads. And um, because we saw the Hiko people, we thought, okay, these must be dead lines, the lines that didn't have any electricity in it. So we went over the lines. We just bulldozed over over the the cables, and there were quite a few of them that we had to go over. We finally got out of Lahaina, uh, and um, and it was uh, it was a long ways. Um, we we were after we got out of Lahaina, and we took many many detours, but finally got on the highway to get to Wailuku, and and. Um, even then, the road was very slow moving because the they were trying to... So people were coming into Lahaina because at that time, um, it was maybe 5 o'clock or so. People who were coming into Lahaina were workers that didn't know that there was a big fire. And, they were, and tourists who didn't know there was a big fire. And they had reservations at the Kanapali hotels. But the police officers were turning them around at Ma'alaya so that um, that was the road that we were on. So we were all trying to uh, move on the same road, which was why it took us a long time. Usually it takes about 45 minutes to go from Lahaina to Wailuku. It took us from 3.30 to 7 o'clock that day to get to Wailuku. So we were trudging along. Um, but I'm very, very grateful and very glad and very blessed that we did not turn right on that line of cars because I'm sure we would have been one of those cars that would have been stuck and and been burnt and uh, people had to jump in. That's where people had to jump into the ocean because uh, their cars were were on fire, so they had to jump into the ocean. Um, and uh, we were very blessed and lucky that we did not take that route. We went to Wailuku and. Um, we got out safely. Uh, there were quite a few. I mean, my cousin has uh, another story, and that's for him. And I know I'm not sure how much time we have, so I I, I do want to wrap it up. But there's lots of everyone in La Hena has a has a story to tell, and so um, it's sad. My whole my whole home is totally destroyed. There's nothing left. Nothing. Uh, no house. No structure. The our refrigerator looks like it was a piece of metal that had been crumpled up. Nothing standing at all. Uh well, I take that back. Our wash house, which was just made out of concrete, is standing, but I'm not sure what it looks like inside um, because uh, of the fire. So um, we haven't been back, and we haven't uh, because I am. And I'm very lucky and blessed that we have a home here and my brother has a home in Iowa. Um, but because I do not have a Lahaina address on my 
driver's license, I could not get back into Lahaina to check on my home. Um, I've seen pictures of it, but I've um, not been able to go and actually buy my on my own or literally go and be there. And I'm not sure how soon we can do that. I heard that now there's some openings. There's some places that are open. The people who could go back are the people whose homes were standing, but my home was not standing. So we could not, uh, I'm not able to get back there yet. So that's our status right now. Well, Judy, the heartwarming part of your story was these people who were there and much and not caring about their own personal safety were clearing the road. Yes. I mean, you, you, eloquent, I, I, you know, I haven't heard a better description of what happened that day than your description. And that's not hyperbole, that's truth. And I want to just tell our audience before we end today, uh, we are running out of time, that um, yet it, uh, I guess it was the 20th of September, Jay Fidel and Mihaela Stoops um, really talked about what's happening in terms of insurance, things on the ground, how people are recovering. And it's one of the best reports that I've seen. Um, and it's on Think Tech Hawaii, and it's um, um, from the 20th of, of September, and that's a great interview. The other thing is I just wanted to share with you, Judy, being a local girl, me being a local guy here on Oahu, um, is that um, Brian Schatz gave a speech in the U.S. Senate on September 5th, and he outlined and gave pictures of many of the things that have happened. And, you know, it was a heartfelt speech from a senator, and it was, you know, you, you, there were Republicans and and of course, our president came and, and visited the site and things like this. So, um, you know, the, the tragedy um, may, may um, and I hope, will bring uh, people together. And I'm going to leave you with all the, the last words on this, um, on your story, Judy. Um, but I, I think the words that um, are a subtitle for this show is Maui Strong. But I'll leave the, the ending to you. Yeah, so... We are very blessed that, you know, I have a home to come to. There's many people who have not. And so one of the things that we, um, I hope that people will have is continue to have hope and continue to be strong so that um, Maui, Lahaina can be rebuilt. Um, and we can rebuild as long as we continue to have hope and faith in each other and um, and continue to um, and the wonderful thing is that there are so many people who have been so generous. And so I want to thank those people who have been so very generous, whether it be for goods or for monetary um, donations. Um, it's We're going to need it for a long, long time. So um, we need to continue to have the fortitude and the perseverance so that we can continue to um, build and not give up hope. Uh, and to know that Lahaina can go, come, can come back, but we must all stand together to to do that, and not um, not give in to um, what people might think might be a quick buck. But um, if we really love Lahaina, we can do this. We just it's it's gonna take time and and perseverance, and uh, yeah, continue to move on. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Judy, and thank you for the uh, for this wonderful journey of the mind.